Let's invite a Pastor Mike. Okay. So what we're doing today is a little bit unusual. It's a little bit different. All right, just saw somebody I haven't seen in years. <laughs> hey, Takio. Um, so yeah, so, okay, give me a second here. Uh, so what we're doing today is a little bit unusual. Uh, as you know, Adoni and I, we really take our, uh, the message, the Sunday service experience and the message really seriously. Uh, it's really important to us. We really want to create like a quality experience. We want to create something that people are excited to come to every Sunday. So we don't let go of that very easily. Sometimes people have come to us and said, hey, would you let me give a sermon at your church? And we're like, ah, sorry. <laughs> and, you know, that just kind of is the way it is sometimes. Uh, but as I was preparing for the sermon this Sunday, I, I happened upon a video, a sermon a recording. And, and, we, and I do this often. I, I watch sermons by other pastors because I figure it's good to learn from people who've been doing this for a long time maybe who have a lot more experience. I think that's a really easy way to learn uh, how to do your job better, I guess you could say. And uh, oftentimes what we do is, well, I'll watch a sermon and I'll pull resources from different areas, different texts, different videos, and we'll try to create a sermon using elements of, of different things, right? And, uh, but this message that I watched online was so, in my opinion, so exceptional that I realized I can't reproduce this for another 10 or 20 years. I just don't, I don't have the life experience. I don't have the knowledge and wisdom. I don't have the, uh, the, the, the training or whatever. And I, but I thought this message was so valuable for me. Like it really touched me in so many ways. And I really felt that um, it really fits in so well with the sermon series we're doing right now on building God-centered families that I just felt, why not, why don't we just watch it together? Um, and so I hope that the message is as meaningful for you as it was for me. Uh, it's a little bit of a long message, so we've actually cut it in half. We'll be watching the first part today, and we'll wa be watching the second part next week. So you have to come both weeks if you want to watch the whole thing. Or if you can't make it, I'll just send you the link. But because uh, I want you to see it, uh, it it's, it's just um, you know we we it's not necessary to hold on to our pride. I like Adonia and I. We don't feel like we need to give all the messages. If there's a message out there that can be valuable and contribute to our well-being of our community, then there's no shame in sharing it. You know, even if it's by another pastor of another church. So the sermon is, is given by Pastor Rick Warren. Uh, as you know, I've talked about him a lot. He's a pastor that I respect a lot. He, um, he moved out to uh, L.A. With his, with his wife, who was pregnant at the time, because they felt the calling by God to start a church. And there was no church there. There was no family there. He had no people that were ready to work with him. He went, they went out there on faith to start the church all on their own. And from that church, they created a mega church with tens of thousands of people. And then they started satellite locations. And their church has grown to be well over 100,000 people now. And so uh, he's really accomplished an amazing amount. And the thing that I really love about that happens if I talk too long. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the thing that I love about his church is that they've been able to maintain the small family, the family experience, even though there's so many people, which is really quite remarkable because, you know, sometimes if you have too many people, you don't really feel close to anybody anymore. So, um, so I've realized that there's a lot of things to learn from him, other people, you know, there's so many people out there who've done so much. So that being said, please enjoy the message. Good morning, Saddleback. You all look like you got an extra hour of rest last night. Have I told you lately that I love you? <laughs> I really, 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 really do. And I had so much fun at Blocktober the other night talking to our kids, literally hundreds, maybe thousands of kids that I got to talk to. There was so much fun. And uh, the future of our church family is very secure. A lot of bright kids, a lot brighter than you guys are. 
I want to say hi to all of our campuses, and many of our campuses did Blocktober in their locations too. I want to say hi to those of you who are watching online or our online campuses. Last week we had people in 22,000 different locations around the world participating in our service. Isn't that amazing? 22,000 different locations. So, hi to all of you. Now if you take out your message notes, uh, we're continuing in a series that Kay and I started last week called Awesome Relationships. Next week we're gonna look at how do you build lasting friendships, friendships that last a lifetime. The week after that, the founder of eHarmony, Christian counselor Neil Clark Warren, is coming to talk about how do you find the love of your life. And the week after that, I'm gonna be speaking on how do you have the most awesome relationship with God. Last week we looked at marriage. This week I'm gonna look at how do you have an awesome family, fighting for an awesome family. I chose this word intentionally, fighting, because families are not awesome by accident. They're, by accident, they're average. And you have to fight for your family if you want it to be a great family because there are all kinds of forces working against your family in our society. Now I'm not gonna spend a minute detailing those. I don't wanna make a laundry list or a litany of all of the things that are working against the family today, but there are economic forces, there are spiritual forces, there are moral forces, there are cultural and social forces that want to destroy the idea of family and specifically your family. What I'm much more interested in is looking at the positive side, and that is how do you fight for an awesome family? You know, when the families of Jerusalem were under attack thousands of years ago, the leader, Nehemiah, said this. So look up here on the screen. He said to the people, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who is awesome. Everything's awesome, including God. And we're looking at awesome relationships. Remember the Lord who is awesome and fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, fight for your homes. He's saying your family is worth fighting for. Don't just give up and say, well, it can't change. It can't be any different. It's too late. It's not too late. No matter where you are on the continuum of family, starting out or at the end or helping a new family develop, no matter where you are, it's not too late to fight to make your family better. Now, what I wanna share with you today is not just from God's word, but from 40 years of counseling families. And I have discovered after talking to thousands and thousands of families that you can find four common traits in families that are really awesome. And we're gonna look at those today. And in order to help you remember these four traits of an awesome family, whether you're a brother or a sister in a family, or you're a mother or father, or you're a child, or whatever you are, um, these are four things that make an awesome family. And the first symbol of an awesome family is this board game called Candyland. <laughs> How many of you remember the board game Candyland? How many of you have played this game, Candyland? How many of you wish you never have to play it again? Yeah, yeah, the, all the hands of preschool moms just went up just now. This is, doesn't require a whole lot of intelligence to play this game. In fact, it says ages three years and up. It's a pure game of chance. But why does the game Candyland represent awesome families? Here's the first reason, write it down. Awesome families are playful. It's the first common denominator of great families. They know how to play. They know how to fun, have fun. They enjoy life together. This is a missing ingredient in so many families today. Uh, today our families are too busy, too tired, too negative, too worn out, and too serious. Who wants to come home from school to that? Families should be fun. The average family is all work and no play. It's just getting us to the next appointment. Awesome families are fun. Awesome families are playful. Now, at Blocktober, you know, we had tens of thousands of kids here at the Lake Forest campus. So I decided I'd do a little kid on the street interviews. And today I'm gonna share with you some of the results. And one of the questions I asked kids was, what, um, what fun things does your family like to do together? And watch these answers. Go to parties and try at fun places. I like I like 
like to go to Legoland and ride train. Play soccer, go to the beach. Make uh, jokes. Make jokes? Yeah. I like to help my mom cook. Go to the skate park. Oh, play tennis. I like to go bike riding and surfing. We sometimes make cookies. Uh, play tag. I like to do crafts. We like to go to Disneyland. Mm, go to Disneyland? Go to Disneyland. Go to Disneyland. Yeah. Mm, open presents with my family at my birthday and Christmas. Um, go to church. And we have family dinners and family Bible study too. Sometimes I like to go bowling and go here. Bowling and what? Go to Saddleback Church. And Saddleback Church, oh sure, of course. <laughs> that kid's gonna be a pastor. That, that's my new intern, little Pastor Rick, right there. Now, the fact is, your family is not a boot camp, and parents are not drill sergeants. And your family is not a business, and parents are not CEOs. And your family is not a laboratory experience, experiment, and your parents are not Research scientists experimenting go, let's add a little of this, a little of this, we're gonna make the perfect little child. There is no perfect child and there is no perfect family. And there is no science to being a family. It's an art, it's an art. But the Bible has a lot to say about it and one of the things that I say is that families are supposed to be fun. Most people know that the Bible teaches we're supposed to work and the Bible tells us that we're to work hard and the Bible says that if we're lazy we shouldn't even eat. Work is an important part of your life. But most people don't know that the Bible says that play is an important part of your life. And play is essential to adults, not just to children. In fact, play is, is connected to creativity. The more play you have in life, the more creative you're gonna be. If you don't have anything play, any fun in your life, you're not a very creative person. All work, no play makes Jack a dull boy. And so you need to have fun in your life. And the Bible talks about this and actually commands it. Let me show you some scriptures. Uh, this first section is from Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived. God said, what do you want me? He said, I want to be the wisest man who ever lived. God said, I'll answer that request. So let's look at some verses. Ecclesiastes 8:15. Solomon says, I commend the enjoyment of life. Circle the word enjoyment. As I said, we know that play is extremely important to development. In fact, we know, we've known for years that play is essential to preschoolers. For preschoolers, play is work. They're actually developing when they play. And, and recess is not a waste of time. Recess, it, kids are developing at much at recess as they are sitting down with a book open or things like that. Paul says, uh, up here on the screen, look at this verse, 1 Timothy 6, 17. God generously gives us everything for our what? Did you realize that everything in the world God created, he created for you to enjoy? Now listen, God wants life to be enjoyed, not merely endured. And a lot of you are simply enduring life. God wants you to enjoy life. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon says, I recommend, I commend the enjoyment of life. God says everything I created is for enjoyment. If you're too busy to enjoy life, you're too busy. God meant for you to play and to have some fun. Ecclesiastes 11:7. People ought to enjoy every day, not just on a weekend, not just vacation, ought to enjoy every day of their lives no matter how long they live. Now why is that important that you enjoy every day? Because you don't know how long you're gonna live. You don't know if you've got next week, next month, you don't know if you've got tomorrow, you don't know if you've got tonight. So whatever living you're gonna do, you better do it now, not say, well, I'm gonna enjoy life in retirement. No, you need to enjoy life now, and if you have children, you need to be enjoying life with the children, because the kids aren't gonna be at home forever. When my kids were growing up, I determined that the number one thing I wanted them to know about our family was not that we were godly, it was not that we were smart, it was not you know whatever thing, else, but that they were loved and that we had fun together. And I created all kinds of things just to have fun that weren't very expensive. One of them was called Daddy's Magical Mystery Tour. And the kids loved it, and it's a, it's a hallowed reputation in our family. I now do it with the grandkids. In Daddy's Magical Mystery Tour, I'd take my kids when they were young, they're all in preschool or grade school, and they get in their pajamas, they go to bed at seven o'clock. 
And long about 11 o'clock or midnight, I'd go in and wake them all up. <laughs> Get out of bed! Get out of bed right now! It's time for Daddy's Magical Mystery Tour! And they go, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. It means this, A, we're not going to school tomorrow. <laughs> and B, we're about to have something really, really fun. Now it could be something expensive, like one time I woke them all up. We didn't have a pool, we didn't have a hot tub or a jacuzzi, and so I woke them all up one time about midnight. We put them in the car in their pajamas, drove down to Carlsbad, checked into a hotel that had a master bedroom with a giant, giant bathtub. We filled it with uh, water and a bunch of bubbles, all jumped in in our swimming suits, grabbed a bunch of junk food, and had a party <laughs> at one o'clock in the morning with first graders and third graders. And was, now, they all didn't have to be that expensive. Sometimes I'd wake them up in the middle of the night and say, we're gonna go make a, a 15 cent ice cream run at Thrifties. And Kay was going, you can't do that. She was the rule keeper, I was the fun meister. <laughs> and by the way, you need both in a marriage. So if you watched last week's message, you, you know what we're talking about. <laughs> but, uh, but we had so much fun. Now, now I want you to write this sentence down, and it, re, or it applies to you, whether you're a parent or not, whether you ever get married or not. Here's an important thing in life. People don't remember what you say, but they will remember how you made them feel. That's important advice for a boss, for an employer, for a husband, for a boyfriend, for a girlfriend, for a parent, for a husband or wife. People will not remember what you say they will remember how you made them feel. My kids don't remember anything of what I said in the early years of their lives, but they do remember how daddy made them feel. Awesome families are playful. They're Candyland families. They have a lot of fun. Now, Solomon gets very specific about the kind of fun you're supposed to have in a family. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 9, he says this. Enjoy life with your wife. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. Dads, if you're a dad here today, the greatest gift you can give your children is to love their mom. To have fun and enjoy life with their mom. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. You see, when a father shows love for the mother of the kids, it creates great stability. It creates great security. It creates great peace in the heart of little children. And when I hear couples saying, well, you know, we, don't, we really can't afford or can't have time to go out because of the kids, serious mistake. Serious mistake. Your kids need to see you loving each other because you are the first and greatest model of relationships. And if they see parents just passing in the night and working and working and working but no real relationship, that's what they're gonna grow up thinking marriage is all about. Love your wife, enjoy life with your wife. The Bible says in Psalm 127, children are a gift from God. They are a gift from God. Now let's be honest, sometimes they're a gift you'd like to exchange. Okay, but, but they are a gift, okay, they are a gift. And what is a gift? A gift is given and it's meant to be enjoyed. Are you enjoying your kids or are they just your pet project, you're gonna grow up right and it's all serious and you're not enjoying the gift that God gave you. Psalm 8, 15, this one's gonna blow your mind. Look at this verse on the screen. You should write this one down. It says, I recommend having fun. Did you know that verse is in the Bible? The wisest man who ever lived said, I recommend having fun. And that way, you'll experience some happiness along all the hard work that God gives you. Now, you know, I asked uh, the producers of these little kid on the street interviews to give a lot of variety of answers. And I said, put, you know, don't all put the same because honestly, I was stunned, I was shocked, I was amazed at how when I asked, what's the number one thing you like to do with your family? I got the same answer over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And it shocked me. 
in an age of technology and in an age of, of uh, all these different entertainment places. The number one answer was not go to Disneyland or go to an amusement park. The number one answer that kids said when you like to do something with your family, what's the number one thing you like to do? It was over and over, play board games. The number one answer. It wasn't play video games. You would have thought that. It was play board games. Why? Because video games are one-on-one -on -one personal game. Board games, you actually interact with adults. And that's why they said you like it. We're sitting around the table. My mom and dad are there and we're playing board games together. The number two answer. What do you love to do with your, answer, with your kids, with your, what do you buy, with, your, with your family most? Number two answer was go to a park. Go to a park? How old fashioned can you get? He said, what do you do at a park? We throw frisbee, we play catch, we play tag, we lay around, we talk, we have a picnic. And the number three answer, you'd figure this in Orange County, go to the beach. In all three answers, what was the common denominator? Time with parents. It wasn't Disneyland, it was time with parents. You see, I talk to guys all the time, says, I don't get it. Successful businessman. I don't get it. I buy my wife and kids all these trinkets and things and I give them everything they need. What do they want? I'll tell you what they want. They want you. They want your attention. They want your focus. They want your eyes. They want your time. You spell love, T-I-M-E. The greatest gift you can give your kids is your time. Because when you give them your time, you're giving your life. You can always buy things. Kids don't need things. They need time. They need fun with the family. They need fun in the home. They need it to not be a boot camp or something we're just all working on. They want time with you. And so Candyland is the symbol of an awesome family because awesome families are playful. Now the second symbol of an awesome family is a watering can, a watering can. Because we use this to, to water flowers, plants, you know, vegetables. And in many ways, a family is like a garden. You have to grow it. You have to develop it. You have to cultivate it. A garden doesn't grow on its own. You have to weed it. You have to water it. You have to care for it. And this is the second characteristic of awesome families that makes them different from average families. Write this down. Awesome families encourage growth. They create an atmosphere of lifelong learning. They help each other develop. They encourage the discovery of each person in the family's shape, S-H-A-P-E. We got a class on that next week. If you don't know what we're talking about, spiritual gifts, heart, ability, personality, experiences, called Class 301. It'll be taught next weekend along with 101, 201, 301, and 401. If you haven't taken those classes, you ought to take them. They help you be a better parent, a better partner, a better person. And, and one of the things that you do in, a, in, a, in an awesome family is you support each other. And I'm not just talking about the kids growing up. I'm saying that you're always growing. Your family never stops growing. Mom never stops growing. Everybody encourages mom to grow. Dad never stops growing. Everybody encourages dad to grow. Brother, sister, everybody encourages everybody to keep growing. If you're not growing, your family is boring. You're just stuck in a rut. You haven't learned anything new, developed any new interest in a long time. Your family's boring. Now look at how Jesus grew. The Bible tells us in Luke 2.52, this is when Jesus was 12 years old. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and favor with men. Now notice, there are four kinds of growth you want to have in your family. You grow in wisdom, that's intellectual growth, mental growth. You grow in stature, that's physical health. You grow in favor with God, that's spiritual growth. And you grow in favor with man, that's social growth. Every person in your family needs to be growing in all four of these. Not just the kids, but you, mom, you, dad, you, brother, you, sister. You need to be growing physically, mentally, spiritually, and socially. How are you going to be different a year from today? Are, do you know any more than you knew a year ago? Are you closer to God than you more, were a year ago? 
Are you more loving than you were a year ago? Are you literally growing? Awesome families encourage growth. Average families just stay the same. Nobody changes, nobody grows. Now I asked the kids, um, what have you learned in your family? And here's what they said. It's not all about me and then it's about other people and you need to love. They always teach me homework. They've taught me a lot of math, a lot of Spanish. They taught me how to read and write. They've taught me to never run away at Disneyland. Not say bad words. Like if my brother gets mad at me, I shouldn't get mad at him and get back. Do not talk to strangers. To be kind. Be kind. And you won't and if you don't be kind, you don't get any friends. God's love never stops. Don't copy the behaviors of this world. Try to be teachable. My mom teaches me how to hula hoop. Hula hoop. Even if it's hard to tell the truth, that you should always do it. Manners? Well, my dad always says manners make the man. They taught me a lesson about God. That family never gives up, and that family is always there. You can always count on them to be there for you. Even when you go through hard times, always trust in God, and because he'll help you get through it. <laughs> Now, what do we really learn from our families? Well, there's some things, if you don't learn them in your family, you're never gonna learn them. You can't learn them at school, you can't learn them at work, you only can learn them in your family. And I will tell you this, most of your problems as an adult comes from the fact that you didn't learn certain things correctly as a child. And if you didn't learn certain skills as a child, then you're gonna have a rough life the rest of your life. There are five things you must learn in your family. And if you don't learn them there, life's gonna be tough for you. You might write these down. The first one is, the first thing we have to learn is what to do with feelings. One of the most important skills in life. How do I handle my emotions? What do I do with them? How do I deal with how I feel? What do you do with feelings? And in a good, awesome family, you learn how to recognize your feelings, how to name your feelings, how to own up to your feelings, how to identify your feelings, how to express your feelings correctly rather than incorrectly, how not to stuff them, and how to deal with how you feel. If you don't learn how to deal with how you feel in your family, you go through life an emotional cripple. You have to relearn it somewhere else. And the reason why so many marriages split up is because they didn't learn in their family how to deal with how you feel correctly and effectively. And you need to let people be honest and let kids express their emotions. One of the stupidest things a parent can say is, stop crying, don't cry, don't cry. Why? Crying, there's nothing wrong with crying. Tears are a gift from God. If you're telling your kids, stuff your emotions, stuff your emotions, stuff your emotions, they're gonna have problems with their emotions the rest of their life. There's nothing wrong with crying. There's nothing uh, to be ashamed of with crying. And telling your kids stop crying is saying, deny your emotions, deny how you feel, and you learn to stuff it. And that comes out in all kinds of strange relationship patterns later on. In a true family, in an awesome family, we learn how to recognize that's a good emotion, that's a harmful emotion. And we learn to name it, own it, speak about it, identify it, talk about it, that's a key. So you name them, you don't stuff them. Second skill you have to learn in the family is how to handle conflict. And if you don't learn how to handle conflict in your marriage or in your family, you're gonna have problems in your marriage because you don't know, nobody taught you the skills on how to resolve and clarify conflict. And if kids don't see their parents working problems out in front of them and showing how this is how we deal when we have a difference. This is how we deal when we get hurt, how we deal with when we get mad. Then you have a problem with that. And what happens is most people in conflict, they become either a mute and a martyr or they become a maniac. They either hold it in or they explode it. Everybody, if you don't learn how to deal with conflict, you tend to become a skunk or a turtle. Now skunks, when they're upset, they let everybody know it. They just stink up the place. And they spray and everybody knows they're ticked off. A turtle pulls into their shell and isolates and pulls back out of fear of conflict. 
Now, here's the interesting thing. Skunks always marry turtles. <laughs> Don't look at them. But, but you know one of you is the skunk and one of you is the turtle in your marriage, all right? It's, all, it's true in every single marriage, all right? One of you is the aggressor and one of you pulls back and neither of these is the more godly approach. So neither of you get the higher upper ground morally. They're both ineffective ways to deal with conflict. A third thing, really big thing you have to learn in family is how to handle loss because you're gonna have a lot of losses in life. You're gonna have big losses, you're gonna have small losses. And you gotta teach kids, and even parents have to learn how to grieve a loss. Because nobody wins all the time. In fact, for a kid to have an unbroken string of wins in early life with no losses is actually detrimental to them. You don't want your kid to win all the time because when they get out in the real world and they face the inevitable losses that they're not number one all the time, it's devastating if they haven't learned that failure won't kill you. Failure won't destroy you. A loss won't be the end of your life. You don't win everything. It's like in a, if you're in a, a professional baseball team, it's actually good to have a few losses in preseason because then the pressure's off. What you don't want to do is have an unbroken season of all perfect wins and then lose in the Super Bowl. That's the, that's the painful. If you're going to lose, you might as well lose early in life and learn from it. And so we learn how to deal with losses and we treat the losses of kids as big things so they can learn how to grieve. I remember when Matthew, my youngest, was quite young and he had a pet hamster named Wilson and Wilson died. Now we didn't treat it and say, oh, he's just a hamster, come on. I mean, really, it's just a glorified rat, you know. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know we, didn't, we didn't just poop and say, oh, you can get another one, I'll get you another one tomorrow. No, no, we treated it very seriously. We had a family funeral for Wilson. And we went down into the canyon and we buried him in a little box and, and we all stood around and we each had our little say of how much we loved Wilson and well, how much he meant to our family and, 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 and things like that. And what I was doing is we, I was teaching the kids the theology of grief. That it's okay to express grief. It's okay to be sad. In fact, you're gonna be sad many, many times in life in much bigger ways. And so we don't demean it, we don't de uh, dismiss it. We deal with the losses of life. You know, there's another board game that we played a lot growing up. You know this one too, it's called Shoots and Ladders. How many remember Shoots and Ladders? How many have played Shoots and Ladders? Yeah, this is a metaphor for life, friends, because life is a set matter of shoots and ladders. You roll the dice, and when you hit a ladder, you get to go up, and you roll the dice, and when you hit a shoot, you go down, and that's the way life works. It's not all ups and downs. Now one of the advantages of games like Shoots and Ladders uh, is because in games of chance, it puts adults on the exact same level as a kid. You don't have any advantage with your college degree in playing Shoots and Ladders, <laughs> okay? It's just the roll of the dice, so you're no better than a two-year-old at playing this game. And the fact is in life, some things actually you take you up, and, and you're gonna have some real successes in life, but don't get full of pride, and don't get you know, full of ego, because on the next roll, you're gonna hit a shoot, and you're going down. And sometimes, you're ahead of everybody else in the family, but in two uh, roles, you may be behind everybody else in the family. That's life. That's life, that's the way life is. And it's teaching kids how to have ups and downs, ups and downs in life, and not get upset about it. A game like this teaches things like, take your turn. And some people never learn to take their turn. You can see them on the freeway. <laughs> okay, they're just cutting off everybody else. It's not like take your turn in getting into that lane, okay? It teaches teamwork, but the main thing it teaches is how to win graciously 
and how to, that losing won't destroy you. That it's just a part of life. So that's one, one of the reasons, the values of board game is it teaches us how to handle losses. One of the verses you need to memorize, whether you're a parent or not, every person should memorize this verse, write it down. Proverbs 24, 16. You need to teach this verse to your children. Proverbs 24, 16. It's one of my life verses. It says this, here on the screen. Even if good people fall seven times, they'll get back up again. I love that verse. It says, even good people fall. The word there, actually in Hebrew, is the word righteous. It says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Even when good people fall, you know what? Even the best people, the well-intentioned people, they stumble, they mess up, they flub, they say the wrong thing, they do the wrong thing. We all fall, we all stumble, we all mess up. And when we fall, that's not the important thing. It says good people get back up again, even if they fall seven times. That's the difference between a success and a failure. That verse is talking about what psychologists call resilience. Resilience is the most important characteristic for a child if they're gonna succeed in life. Resilience. Do they have the ability to get back up again? They fall off the bike. See, a lot of kids learn, I'm not even gonna try because I, I stumbled once, so I give up. I went to one practice at, at music and I didn't like it, so I'm just gonna give up. I went to one game uh, in soccer, and I didn't like it. All right, I, I messed up, I embarrassed myself, so I'm gonna give up. And, and so people learn to give up and then they spend the rest of their lives facing challenges and giving up. But in teaching a child resilience to keep on getting back up, those are the, the leaders of the world are people who have the most resilience. They're not any more successful, they have just as many losses in life, it's just they don't give up. And they are resilient. Shoots and ladders, metaphor for life. Number four, fourth thing we learn from our families is we learn what values matter most. What values matter most. And you have to just help your kids know this is important and this is not. Now, would you agree that the world is teaching our kids values that aren't very good? Everybody agree with that one? All around us, the world is teaching our kids values that we don't agree with. The world teaches that all that matters is how you look. That image is everything. Doesn't matter what your character is, it's how you look. The world teaches that the more money you have, the more important you are, the more successful, uh, the more fulfilled you'll be, uh, the more significant your life is. That's not true. The world teaches is that everything is about sex. It's not. It's not. The world teaches that the more you can get people to praise you, the more valuable you are. That's not true. And, and our kids are learning a lot of values from movies, from video games, from songs, from their friends, from all of culture, all these things that aren't true. It's important to teach our kids the three basic temptations of life. The only good thing you can say about Satan is he's entirely predictable and he doesn't have any new temptations. There are only three temptations. The Bible calls them the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It has to do with how I feel, what I do, and what I get in life. S secularist or philosophy would call them hedonism, materialism, and secularism. But basically, it's sex, salary, and status. It's basically saying life is about three things. Getting all the good things you can, possessions, having all of the pleasure you want, regardless of how it hurts other people, passion, and becoming important and having status, that's position. These are the three temptations that Jesus went through, that Moses went through, that Adam went through. I could take you through the whole Bible. And, and teaching our kids, what these are so they can recognize false values. That what matters most in life is sex, what matters most in life is money, and what matters most in life is power, prestige, and popularity. They're just not true. And every single advertising ever created by anybody appeals to one of these three temptations. Every single one. 
Every print ad, broadcast ad, TV ad appeals to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And the product says, you get our product, you'll be sensual, you'll feel good, you just have all kinds of pleasure inside of you. Or if you get our product, you'll be envied. You'll, you're number one, we do what's best for you. Look out for number one and, and I gotta do what's best for me. And it's all about you, you, you. Or, or, or materialism, you need this product because it'll make you significant. It'll make you important. You know, when my kids were little, I taught them these three values. I said, these are the three values you're gonna be up against and none of them are true. And I would, we would stand in front of the TV and watch commercials and I would pay them a nickel for the one who could figure out which value was being promoted by that ad. Ah, lust of flesh, boom, here's a nickel. Now I realize that was materialism. <laughs> but at least they were learning to spot what most kids and even adults accept without question. We, we teach our kids the values that matter most. And the fifth thing we learn from our families is good habits. Good habits. Habits are determine your character. In one of the interviews I did uh, at Blocktober, one little kid said, I said, what did you learn from your family? He said that manners make the man. He said, my dad tells me that all the time. Manners make the man. I thought, whoa, I know CEOs who don't know that. They're mean, they're rude, they're bossy, they're pushy, they're prima donnas. They don't know that manners make the man. I'm going, that little kid knows more than that CEO does about the real issue of character. By the way, if you wanna read a good book on some of the, these things, what we learned, we have a couple in our church that have written an outstanding book. Mylon and Kay Yerkovich, well-known counselors, Christian counselors, have written a book, How We Love Our Kids. And I, I highly recommend that book. Now, if one of the marks of, uh, of um, an awesome family is that we help each other grow, how do you do that? How do you help mom grow? How do you help dad grow? How do you help brother and sister grow? How do you help your nephews grow and nieces grow? Well, let me give you two ways that help people grow and two ways that don't. This applies in every area of life. Two ways that help people grow. Number one, we grow through example. Through example. Jesus did this in teaching the disciples. John 13, he says, since I have washed your feet, which was a, a model of humility and service, it's an act of service. Since I have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I've done to you. We learn best by example. Your kids don't wanna hear a sermon, they wanna see it. They wanna see it in your life. The second way we help people grow is through conversations. Critical conversations. If you're not having conversations with your kids about real issues, they're not growing. We grow through conversations. Unfortunately, most conversations we have with kids have to do with we need to get here by this time and get back to here by this time. And conversations are about schedule, eating, or homework. And no conversations about the stuff that really matters in life. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse seven is very specific. And it says this to parents. You must teach God's commandment. That's not an option. You must teach God's commandments to your children and talk about them. Circle that, talk about them. That means conversations. You're to have conversations with your kids about the Bible. Talk about them, and then it gives us four places to do this. When you are at home, you might circle these four things. When you are at home, when you are out for a walk, Third time is at bedtime, and, the, and then number four, the first thing in the morning, breakfast. He's saying, these are the teachable moments of your family. When you're at home, when you're out for a walk, in other words, you're, you're relaxing, recreation time, you're fishing, you're playing, uh, when, at bedtime and first thing in the morning, the four teachable moments. Now friends, this is what God tells us to do, and this is why most families are not awesome. Most families aren't awesome. They're just average. And the reason they're average is because they don't do what God says. God says you need to talk about the things that are important at home, 
when you're relaxing, when you're on vacation, when you're having a walk. You need to do it at bedtime conversations. You need to do breakfast conversations. He said, if you're not doing this, you're never going to have an awesome family. You're going to have an average family. So by example and by conversations are the two ways we help each other grow. You can help your wife, your husband grow through by example and through conversation. Let me tell you two ways that don't work, and it's the ones we all use. Write these down. Not through criticism. Not through criticizing. We think that being critical of someone will actually help them grow. It has never, ever, ever worked. Nagging doesn't work. Condemning doesn't work. Criticizing and complaining doesn't work. It is totally ineffective in helping a person change. Why? Because when you criticize, you're focusing on what you don't want rather than what you do want. For instance, if I'm a professional pitching coach for the Angels or for any team, and I go out on an important game, and I go out to the pitcher on the mound, and I say to the pitcher, whatever you do, don't throw a curveball. What have I just planted in his mind? A picture of a curveball. I didn't give him a picture of the right thing to do. I gave him a picture of the wrong thing to do, and I told him to focus on the wrong thing, and that's gonna pretty much guarantee he's not gonna do the right thing. When you criticize a child or your wife or your husband or anybody else, they go, yeah, you're right. Criticizing just labels people. It reinforces the negative. It does not work. So why are you so critical? Why are you so rough? Why are you so tough on your kids? Why well, want them to be tough? You're not making them tough, you're making them a failure. Through all your incessant criticizing, they never measure up. And at some point, when it's criticism, 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 the kid just goes, okay, I give up. I can't please my dad. I can't please my mom. I, I just give up. And so let me just show you how lazy I can be. Let me show you how late I can be. Let me show you how irresponsible I can be. I'll show you. And so it doesn't work. Judging, criticizing, demean, it, it, is not, it didn't work on you. By the way, it doesn't work in preaching either, which is why I don't use it on you. I could get up here every week and say, okay, let's talk about your sins this week. That'll be a four-hour sermon. Okay. And I could get up here every week and tell you everything you're doing wrong. It doesn't work. Why? Number one, you know what you're doing wrong, and me telling you about it doesn't, isn't going to change it. You have to promote the positive alternative. That's called repentance. Change your mind. Every one of my sermons are preaching for repentance. Repentance doesn't mean stop doing bad. It means start doing good. And that's what it's all about. So not through criticism. Look at what the Bible says, Ephesians 6, 4, to parents. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children. It doesn't work. Making them angry and resentful. Instead, bring them up with the loving, training, and teaching of the Lord. Another verse in the Bible, Colossians chapter 3, it says specifically to dad, it says, Dad, don't be so hard on your kids, you drive them to resentment. It says, don't keep demeaning them, don't keep criticizing them, don't keep judging them, don't keep telling them everything that they're doing wrong that makes them angry and bitter. He says that's dumb for a dad to do. Not to criticize it. And then there's another one that we use, and this one doesn't work either. We don't help people grow this way. Not through comparing. Anytime you compare anybody to anybody else, you've made a major mistake in life. Why, because everybody's unique, everybody's different, there's nobody in the world like you, so you are incomparable. And the Bible tells us not to compare. You should never compare your wife to anybody else. You should never compare your husband to anybody else. You should never compare your lawn or your house, or your job to anybody else. You certainly should never c compare your kids. Why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like your mom? Why can't you be more like your dad? I'll tell you why, because I'm not them. And neither are you. Comparing never, never works. And when you do it, 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 it's unhelpful, it's unfair, and it's lethal to any relationship. You start comparing your wife to somebody else, you're, you're headed for divorce court. 
It's lethal. Just stop doing it. The Bible says over and over again, you should never compare. Let me show you one verse. Galatians 6, 4. Each person should judge his own actions. Let me be the judge of my own actions. And not compare himself with others. Then he could be proud for what he himself has done. You say, wait a minute, I thought pride was a sin. There's a good kind of pride and there's a bad kind of pride. The good kind of pride is, hey, I did the best I could with what I had. I'm proud of what I did. The bad kind of pride is, I'm better than so and so over there. That's comparing. I have a justifiable, legitimate pride in you. I love Saddleback Church and I love you because I love what God is doing through you. All the 500 ministries in the community, all the things we're doing around the world. This church is unique in so many ways, in so many areas, in giving, in commitment, in, in love, in, in, in just the things, the impact that we make. And I'm, I am proud, justifiably proud of you and there's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is if I say, we're better than another church. Does that make sense? Well, the moment I compare, the pride becomes sin. So you take pride in yourself for, man, I did, I, with the gifts God gave me, I did the best I could, I feel pretty good about that. You can take pride in a job well done. The moment you start comparing yourself, but I did better than that guy, now it's, it's fallen into sin. So don't, don't compare. Now let me give you a third symbol of an awesome family. And the third symbol of an awesome family. Okay, well, I, I hope that that message was really meaningful for you. That was the first half, so he shared the first two points. And next Sunday is the second half, and I guarantee you it's just as good as the first half. And he touches on a lot of other topics that are really important, like the value of serving your family, serving the greater good, and uh, many different things. So. Um, for myself personally, a lot of things really touched me about this message. Uh, I, for one thing, I recognize that I I'm too serious many times, and I don't enjoy. I, I get too focused on the things that I have to do or the feel, things I feel responsible for that I don't take time to enjoy my life and enjoy my family and enjoy my kids. And many times when I have opportunities to spend time with my kids and enjoy that time together, I get too caught up in all the other things that I'm doing and then we don't actually have a valuable time together. Anyway, there's many other things too and I hope that there was some meaningful aspects of that message for you. I know that there was for me and I'd like to ask you to join me in prayer. Good morning, our most beloved Heavenly Parent. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for... Uh, each and every person who came together. I'm so grateful for this community. I'm so grateful for this family. Um, I really believe that everything that we learn, uh, that learned this morning and everything that we put, try to put into practice in our lives and in our families, uh, it, we apply it also to our community. And it affects the people that we meet. It affects the world that we live in. And it affects our society, Heavenly Parent. How important it is, each and every one of us, how we live our life and how we grow our families. And, and I really pray that I, I and all of us, we can take Rick Warren's uh, words to heart that uh, no matter how things are, we can always fight to make them better. We can learn how to fight to make, to grow, that we can take that lead in developing ourselves and growing our families and, and learning something new every year I can feel closer to you. I can learn something new. I can become better in some way. So grateful for uh, this message. I really felt for myself it was the message that I needed to hear at this time. And I just pray that um, for today and as we hear the rest of the message next week that uh, it can also speak to our hearts wherever we're at in our lives, whatever we are looking for, whatever we are needing in our life, Heavenly Parent, that you can speak through this message to us. Even though it's a recorded message, Heavenly Parent, it's a living message. And as we are all living and breathing and trying to do our best in our life, Heavenly Parent, this truth, uh, I pray that it can speak to us. It can help heal the difficulties and challenges in our life. It can help us to live a life that we are proud of and inspired by and that we can 
uh, hold our head up to when we, uh, when we are speaking and, and spending our time with you, Heavenly Parent. I thank you for this day. Thank you for all of us being able to be here together. And I offer this prayer in the name of Michael and Adonia Hendrick, a blessed central family. Amen and adieu. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.